It takes trust, similar to pulling down a ship's anchor, to believe in God for a brighter future. It's a faith that makes plans and acts and acts in a way that produces good things. Welcome everyone. In today's video, we're going to tell you tapping into faith to activate the power of God. You bring God's power into your life by making plans and doing good deeds. That kind of faith is pushing toward God while disregarding the cynics and septics. But before we proceed the further video, if you're new to this channel, remember go ahead and to hit the bell icon to subscribe so you won't miss the informative videos we will upload in the future. The crew of a ship must place their hope in the anchor before departing the harbor. But personnel have to lower the anchor in the event of a storm or when a ship enters a harbor without a pier. Jesus' clothing was touched by the lady with the blood issue. And he realized then that authority had left him, but her hope was transformed into faith when she reached out and touched Jesus' clothing. She pressed past a disbelieving mob by faith, summoning Jesus' power of deliverance. Your faith has made you well, he remarked, turning to face her, Mark 5:34. Notice that he did not say your hope or my strength. She told herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well just before she touched it. She saw an opportunity because of hope, but she sought it out because of faith faith-based activation of God's power. In order to comprehend salvation, you must recognize it as God's power dormant in you, rather than just as a future event. You won't be able to use that power until you put your confidence in Jesus and press into Him. Paul distinguished between the breastplate of faith and the hope of redemption in his writing. While faith entails action, hope for salvation is analogous to hope for a better future. I was depressed, but thanks to the lessons I learned on God TV, I was healed of my depression and came to know Christ Norway's Sophia. God can transport you into the kingdom of the Son of His love if you activate His ability to deliver you. That kind of faith will enable Him to use you to fulfill His plan for your life. Clinging to the prospect of redemption. Paul instructed his listeners to put on the breastplate of faith and the breastplate of faith and love in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Love is the cord that gives the anchor its purpose, hope is the anchor. Trust is the act of lowering the anchor. I was feeling terribly alone and had to move. I turned on the TV the first night I was in my new house, and God TV started. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God TV, Gale United Kingdom. Therefore, love and faith are not mutually exclusive, rather. They are both essential to God's plan. For a Christian, having one without the other is no more beneficial than having an anchor and no chain for a ship's crew. When Paul remarked, and now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. He was emphasizing the value of love. According to 1 Corinthians 13, 13, hope and faith in Christ without love are like an anchor without a chain or like a clashing cymbal or sounding brass. Therefore, the expectation that God will save us from life's storms is the hope of salvation. However, we are preserved by God's power via faith for salvation, 1 Peter 1, 9. Positive consequences arise from our faith, which awakens God's power in our life. Christ's anchor, the cross. Sailors can feel comfortable and secure knowing that their ships are anchored to the ocean and sea surfaces. Security in portless harbors and safety amidst crashing waves. The aim of God's grace via salvation is dual, much like that of a ship's anchor. Grace, however, is not the anchor, the act of casting the anchor, or the anchor's chain. Grace is the ship that offers rescue from life's storms so that we might encounter God's ability to move us. Thus, the first goal of redemption is rescue and the second is conveyance. By acting with faith, the woman with the blood issue was delivered from her illness. She was taken into the kingdom of the son of his love as a result of her rescue, taking the run for it, because Jesus underwent the cross, despising the humiliation. For the joy that was set before him, the author of Hebrews 12, 1, 2, referred to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus was able to free us from the grip of darkness by enduring the humiliation of the cross. And because of his ability to deliver us, he also has the ability to bring us into the kingdom of God. Navigating a world devoid of faith enables us to encounter the double aim of salvation. When our hope is transformed into faith, we both experience and demonstrate his ability to deliver us. The author exhorted his readers to run with endurance the race that was set before them in this same text. Read Hebrews 12, 1, 2. Because of the joy set before him, Jesus bore the pain of the crucifixion but because they are encircled by so big a cloud of witnesses, those who follow Jesus have to run their own course. He instructed his listeners to run with endurance the race that was set before them in Hebrews 12.1. The author of Hebrews 6.18 stated, hope is set before us. By concentrating on the joy set before him, Jesus was able to bear the agony of the cross. By concentrating on the hope that lies ahead of us, we can run our course with faith. 
The hope that is placed before us is the hope of salvation, which starts with the hope of deliverance. We have that hope as an anchor of the soul head. 619, but when we transform that hope into faith, God's ability to save us is unleashed. Thus, Hebrews 619 refers to the anchor of the soul as the hope of redemption found in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Additionally, this explains why Jesus told his disciples, truly, the kingdom of God resides within you, Luke 17.21. The author of Hebrews described our trust in Christ as firm and steady, having previously referred to it as an anchor of the soul. We have firm and steadfast faith in Christ because it is able to save you from the grip of evil. However, being able to save you is not deliverance, thus you have to activate it via faith. When he uses his power of deliverance, he will be able to take you into the kingdom of the Son of his light, remaining hopeful. You do not need to lose hope, just as the author of Hebrews told his readers not to give up. By taking a bold step in faith, you can awaken God's power of deliverance within yourself. Even if you might not immediately get the result you're hoping for, taking action on your faith will strengthen it. Furthermore, God will use you in unexpected ways the more your trust grows. You become like the woman with the blood issue when you transform your hope into trust. When she gave up hoping and pushed past the throng to find Jesus, her hope turned into trust. Your ability to be delivered by God will be activated when you press through a world that lacks faith. If you assume your hope will suffice, you are powerless. Alternatively, you could venture out in faith, make plans, take initiative, and start living out God's plan for your life. Four methods for turning on the spirit of power activator No. One speeches incite behavior. God prepared, fashioned, and made the earth and the sky in the beginning. The face of the vast ocean was dark, and the land was formless in an empty waste. Over the seas, the Spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding. God then said, let there be light, and light appeared. Genesis 1, 1, 3, uh, a -M -P -C. The Holy Spirit is constantly aware, constantly attentive, and constantly prepared to act 2 Chronicles 16, 9. But take note the Holy Spirit of God never acts on anything other than what he hears. The Holy Spirit was active during creation, moving, hovering, and brooding, yet nothing occurred until God spoke. However, as soon as he did, the Holy Spirit became unbridled, and the cosmos began to grow at the speed of light 186, double zero miles per second. Compute the numbers. The creative force of God's words traveled almost 17 billion miles in the first 24 hours, and science says it hasn't stopped yet. Power is that. That is the Holy Spirit of God, and that's how words have power. Proverbs 18.21 states that words are powerful and can kill or give life God's words, accomplish whatever he desires, Isaiah 55.11. Things that did not exist are brought into being by God's words, Romans 4.17. God uses his words to both create and preserve the universe, Hebrews 1.3. God is the source of all power, and all power is contained in words. Jesus himself acknowledged, saying, I don't speak for myself. What I am to say and how I am to express it are commands from the Father who sent me. I speak whatever the Father tells me to say because I know that following his instructions will grant me eternal life, John 12, 49, 50. It seems reasonable that we would be bound by God's word if both the Holy Spirit and Jesus are John 16, 13, 15. Thus, just as he did for his disciples, Jesus offers us encouragement by saying, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and has complete faith that all he says will come to pass and be taken care of for him. AMPC, Mark 11:23 you get to decide what happens next. So choose your words carefully. You will summon the necessary spirit of power to bring about the fullness of life you desire if you decide to proclaim God's word and trust. Activate or no. Two, expressing belief. You will carry these words within your heart, as I order you today. You must carefully impart these values to your kids and discuss them with them whenever you sit down, stroll, sleep, or get up from your bed. Deuteronomy 667, NKJV. According to Jesus, seeing does not equate to believing John 20, 24, 29. Instead, the things we say again and over again demonstrate our true beliefs, Mark 11, 23. It's crucial that we train our hearts and minds with the correct words, with life-producing words, since what we think is what we speak. Using the Word of God. Living and prospering results from having God's Word on our lips and in our hearts, Deuteronomy 30, 14, 15. A long, successful, and tranquil existence is produced by the Word of God in our hearts, Proverbs 3, 1, 2. In our hearts, God's Word brings life, healing, and well-being, Proverbs 3, 1, 2. Salvation comes from believing in our hearts and confessing with our words, Romans 10, 9. The method God used to teach His people thousands of years ago, programming our minds and hearts with words to cultivate faith, continues to be effective for us now. 
Kenneth Copeland refers to this process as becoming God insight oriented. It occurs when we study, consider, and speak God's word until it becomes the last word or last say in every circumstance we may encounter. Thus, consider this when everything is against you, when the emotional stakes are high, when the strain is on. What will come out of your mouth next? What will you say that ultimately validates your beliefs? Activator three, having faith and love. Because God has given us his spirit, we may know that we abide in him and that he is in us. We have also come to understand and trust in God's love for us. God is love and the one who lives in love lives in God and God lives in the person. 1 John 4, 13, 16, NKJV. God sent his spirit to be our standby after Jesus ascended back to heaven, just as he had promised Acts 1, 4, 5, 8, 2, 4. The Holy Spirit, who bestows upon you great strength, love and self-control, was sent by him to Timothy 1, 7, TPT. Because he loves us, God sent his Holy Spirit to give us strength. He grants us access to his spirit of love and power around the clock. All we need to do is accept God's power and believe in his love for us as our response. Though it seems simple enough, many Christians find it difficult. Following his miraculous feeding of around 20,000 starving people the day before, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee and was pursued by a sizable throng. Because of what Jesus had done the previous evening, they had personally witnessed this spirit of power at work. So they asked him, we too wish to carry out God's works. How ought we to proceed? John 6, 28. This is the only thing God wants from you, believe Jesus said to them. Verse 29, faith is always the key to calling up God's strength. Unfortunately, because those individuals didn't truly believe what Jesus said that day, Jesus had to confront them all, verse 36. Know this when it comes to accepting God's love. The Lord's unwavering love is eternal lamentations, 322. According to Jeremiah 31, 3, God's love for us is unending, even in our sinful state, Romans 5, 8. God showers us with immense love, 1 John 3, 1. Recognize this when it comes to obtaining God's power. Within us resides the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, Romans 8.11. We are to have the Holy Spirit within us at all times, Ephesians 5.18. The boundless magnificence of God's might for those who trust in Him, Ephesians 1.19. If you have faith in Jesus, you will do more, John 14.12. There is nothing that God cannot accomplish when we are filled with His Spirit and convinced of His love. Like Jesus said to the multitude, God's spirit of power will take care of the rest if we simply concentrate on the believing and receiving part, Mark 11, 24. Activator four, equipping for combat. When the Lord watched, he was angry to see that there was no justice. The fact that no one stepped in to support the oppressed astounded him. So he intervened himself using his powerful arm to save them. He placed the helmet of salvation on his head and put righteousness on his body armor. He covered himself in a garment of heavenly passion and dressed in a robe of vengeance. Isaiah 59, 15, 17. Jesus won the ultimate battle against the forces of evil, including death, hell, and its demons, Revelation 1, 18. However, the fight is not done, and it is our duty as Christians to uphold that triumph for as long as we are here on earth, Romans 8, 12, 14, 37, Revelation 12. Of course, we can rest assured that God still has our backs. The Lord defends us in battle. God uses his powerful arm to redeem his people. Psalm 77, 14, 15. God manifests his power on earth through his people, Isaiah 55, 4. Our rear guard is the glory of the Lord, Isaiah 58, 8, 8. Nonetheless, Almighty God is very certain that we can succeed. As God's cherished offspring, we hold the ultimate say in this conflict with our adversary. The Apostle Paul would counsel us to say this. We are powerful because of the Lord and his awesome might, Ephesians 6, 10. In order to accomplish that and be that, we must prepare for combat by dressing as the Lord did in Isaiah 59. Put on all of God's armor so that you can withstand the devil's plans with strength. Because we are not engaged in combat with actual enemies. Put on all of God's gear, then so that you could stand against the adversary throughout the day of evil, Ephesians 6, 11, 13. Even greater, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of power himself, is now within the direct reach of us as believers in the future generation. Even though the spirit of God did not yet reside among the people of Israel, they looked forward to his presence, knowing that he would come in like a narrow, rushing stream, which the Spirit of the Lord drives overpowering the adversary. We are grateful that Jesus shed his blood for us, as it provides us with what the Apostle Paul refers to as the better covenant, which is better promises, Hebrews 8, 6. And the spirit of power is one of those better promises. That's all for today's video. Remember these four ways to activate the spirit of power if you could use some help getting around without using your hands. 
Just as he did to the Creator on the first day of the world, the Greater One is prepared to answer you with the same speed and ferocity. Don't forget to like the video and hit the subscribe button to avoid missing any new videos from our channel. Thanks for watching and see you all soon.